Uh, over the last few weeks, we have seen different aspects of Jesus' ministry. In the Sermon on the Mount, we saw Jesus as the preacher teacher. Last week, we saw Jesus as the miracle worker. This week, we're going to see Jesus as the disciple maker. In chapters 8 and 9 of Matthew's Gospel, Jesus performs nine miracles. And Pastor Dave did a fabulous job of walking us through each of those miracles last week and showing us that Jesus has authority over disease, death, and the natural world. As the, in, after his last miracle in chapter 9, the text tells us that Jesus started to travel around the countryside, continuing to heal, heal people. Crowds were flocking to him. And then the text tells us something interesting. It says this, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Now, the word for compassion here is a strong word. It, it means that literally he was moved in his gut, that his gut was, was wrenched. The core of who he was was moved because he saw that these people needed a shepherd. And so he uses the metaphor and compares them to a flock of sheep who were suffered under attack. And that word helpless means to be thrown down. They needed a shepherd. And in this moment, Jesus recognizes the enormity of the task he recognizes he needs helpers. And so he turns to his disciples and he says this, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. And church, that is still true today. In other words, Jesus turns to his disciples and he says, I have a job for you. I have a mission for you. I am not taking on this task alone. I need some laborers to go out and participate in the mission to harvest souls. Will you co-labor with me? Now, as Jesus says those words, he begins his call to discipleship, which will be the focus of Matthew chapter 10. And here's the truth. This mission isn't going to be easy. Now, if we're to be successful, we need to be sold out for the gospel. And when I say sold out, I don't mean a crowd at a Taylor Swift concert. No. When I say sold out, I mean this. People who are committed, completely devoted, invested, and engaged to a cause. In other words, we need to be willing to go anywhere to do anything and to give up everything in order to achieve the goal that Jesus has given us to make more disciples. And so in this call, Jesus is going to say some hard things to us today. So with that in mind, let's pray that our hearts would be soft, would be receptive, and would be worthy of the calling that he has given to us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you. And Lord, we recognize that the call of discipleship, the call of Jesus, the example of Jesus is not an easy one. That there's hard things that are before us, Lord, that that there's a hard things we face. And so I pray this morning that as we, we hear Jesus' words and as he calls us to action, that you would, would give us soft hearts, that you would give us receptive hearts, and that you would help us to love you more than anything. We pray that in your name. Amen. Well, the film that should have won the Academy Award for Best Picture in 1998 was Saving Private Ryan. Unfortunately, it was beat out by the sappy love story, Shakespeare in Love, and so sorry if you love that movie, but most guys, I think, thought it should have been Saving Private Ryan. Now, the movie chronicles the mission of a crew of army rangers led by a veteran captain played by Tom Hanks. The movie opens with an elderly man hurriedly running through a cemetery through the, uh, the lines of a ro rows of gravestones. And it becomes clear that the cemetery is in France, near the site of the Ohama Beach uh, battle during the invasion of Normandy. As the old man looks on the graveyard, the movie fades to the original battle, which is told with shocking realism. Now, once that battle is done, we, we learn the overall plot of the movie. Uh, we learn that Private James Francis Ryan is thought to be the only surviving member of four brothers who each fought on D-Day. Can you imagine being his mother? losing three out of four sons. So Tom Hanks and his crew are ordered to go behind enemy lines to find Private Ryan and bring him home so that his mother doesn't have to bear the loss of another son. Most of the movie shows this mission. 
It's a dangerous mission. And the crew encounters enemy soldiers at every turn, eventually finding Private Ryan. As the movie ends, there's one final battle where Tom Hanks and his crew, along with Private Ryan, fight to protect the town from the Nazis. And the only one who survives that battle is Private Ryan. As Tom Hanks' character John Miller is dying, he pulls Private Ryan close to him. He says, my men and I gave my lives for you, and with his final breath, he says this, make it count. Make it count. Make it count. And for the rest of his life, James Francis Ryan was haunted by those words. Now, can you imagine if this happened to you? What if some people came on a rescue mission for you, and you were the only one who survived? They died, you got to live. And when you come to the end of your life, you want to know that you made it count, that you left a legacy worthy of their sacrifice. Now, truthfully, I think all of us feel this tension at some point level. You know, one day we're going to die and we want to know that we left a legacy. We want to know that our lives counted, that we weren't just, just taking up space and air here on this world. Are we living in a way that when you look in the mirror at the end of your lives, you can say that you made it count? In fact, some of us may be wondering that even today. And so I want to pause at the beginning of this message and ask a question. What will your legacy be? Are you making it count? Like Private Ryan, each of us here today, if you're a Christian, has been rescued by Jesus and given new life, even though we don't deserve it. Shouldn't that change the way that we live our lives? You see, Jesus turns to us and says, if you want to leave a legacy that counts, join my mission. Become a sold-out follower for me, and the fruits of your labor will last not just today, but into eternity. In Matthew chapter 10, we discover three components to becoming a mission-focused disciple who will leave a lasting legacy for Jesus. First, we need a crew. Second, we have to be compelled by a cause. And thirdly, we have to face the challenge. So a crew, a cause, a challenge. Point one, we need a crew. Now, as we move deeper into chapter 10 of Matthew, we see that Jesus immediately calls the disciples to himself because Jesus knows that a leader must empower his followers to accomplish this mission. And so he says this, it says he called his disciples to him, his 12 disciples, and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every disease and every affliction. Now that's what I call empowerment. In fact, some of you are sitting in here today saying, I wish my boss would empower me a little bit more. No more micromanaging. Now take notice of that word authority. That was a key word last week. At the end of the Sermon on the Mount, we learn that Jesus, uh, the people that saw Jesus teach were amazed because he had what? He had authority. And so over and over again in chapter 8 and 9, as Pastor Dave showed us, we're told that Jesus performs miracles because he had authority. The wind and the sea obey him. Jesus commands the demons. And now in chapter 10, Jesus is passing on that authority to his followers. Now, some of us are sitting in here saying, I, listen, God can't use me. My past is too checkered. My skills are not the right match. I, I, I got a lot to work on, Pastor Bob. But who are the people that Jesus calls to himself? Look at the list, but verse 2. It says, the names of the 12 apostles were these. Uh, first, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, James, son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, Philip, and Bartholomew, Thomas, and Matthew, the tax collector, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, Simon the zealot, Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Now, at first glance, this list is intimidating. But each of these people were ordinary before Jesus called them and empowered them. And I want you to notice two things about this list. First, God can use anyone from any background. And secondly, they needed each other for the mission. Because each of these men were so focused on the mission that they left a legacy for Jesus. In fact, Peter, let's talk about Peter. Peter was a small business owner. Anybody out there resonate with that? He was eventually crucified upside down for his faith. Andrew 
Peter's less famous brother, does anybody here feel less famous than their sibling? Was crucified on an X-shaped cross that we call a St. Andrew's cross. James left a successful family business to follow Jesus. Herod Agrippa killed him in A.D. 44. Thomas was a skeptic, but he got over his doubts, and he eventually went to India and preached the gospel and was killed with a spear. James, the son of Alphaeus, or James the Lesser, and he was called that because he was either younger, he was shorter, or he was less uh, well-known than the other James. You see, you see, God calls those who are young and those who are short of stature. Amen? <laughs> he preached the gospel in Egypt where he was crucified and later his body was sawed into pieces. Simon the Zealot, he was a rough and tumble guerrilla war fighter who wanted to bring the kingdom of God by force. You see, God can even use people who have military backgrounds. Amen. He preached the gospel as far as Britain where he was crucified in A.D. 74. You see, these men came from varying backgrounds, but all were faithful to Christ. They were called apostles, a word that means messenger. It comes from the Greek word apostoleo, which means I send. In other words, they were Jesus' authoritative represent, representatives who played a foundational role in the establishment of the church. So God can use anybody from any background, but secondly, recognize this. These men needed each other for the mission. In fact, in this list, Matthew groups each of these guys in pairs. It's hard to see in the English text, but it's very recognizable in the Greek text. In Mark 6, 7, we read that Jesus sends his followers out two by two. So it seems that makes sense here. In the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 17 and 19, there was also a command for two witnesses, which reflects the Jewish custom of sending officials out in pairs. You see, Jesus knows something that we have to recognize. We need a crew. We need a crew. We need other people speaking into our lives to help us grow we need other people helping us, encouraging us along in the mission. Now, personally, I cannot tell you how life-giving it is to work with another pastor like Dave, who has a like-minded mission for our church. On our elder board, we have shepherding groups, and we split them into twos. Why? Because it's biblical. In his excellent new book, Them, Why We Hate Each Other and How to Heal, Senator Ben Sass asserts that we have a loneliness epidemic in America, and he uses an example. At the opening chapter of his section on loneliness, he tells the story about a heat wave that hit Chicago in the summer of 1995. For seven days in July, the upper Midwest sweltered under 100-plus temperature degree days. Oddly during this, the windy Cindy wasn't very windy. The heat index topped out at 120. At night, the temperature only fell to the high 80s. It was pretty hot. So Chicago wasn't built for this kind of heat wave, and 739 people died. Oddly, with the polar vortex right now, I think some people are dying as well, even though it's really cold. But the same principle applies. You see, when the CDC studied the heat wave, they discovered that the people most vulnerable to death were those who had no social networks. In other words, there were many people who had no social connections, and when the AC went out, nobody thought to check on them. They were left to die alone. And what Ben Sass goes on to say is that the Chicago fire is endemic of what we are experiencing in America, that we have less social connection than we did 50 years ago, and loneliness is killing us. And if you're here today longing for a community, let me just encourage you to, to get involved here at NBC. Um, we have small groups you can join. There's places you can serve, whether with kids or teens or Relief Bus or Market Street Mission, World Impact, Feeding. Well, there's so many places you can be involved. Go on a mission trip because in those moments is when you build community. Going to church isn't enough. In fact, I'd like to give you an image to think about for the rest of this message over here. I know you've been wondering what's underneath this thing here. <clears throat> I got this on loan from Bell Labs from my friend Paul Wilford. <laughs> a, red, a red thing. Does anybody here know what this is, right? <laughs> now, if you're maybe, maybe over 40, let's just say, uh, you know what the purpose of this is. If you're somewhere under 40, even though I, I actually had one of these growing up, um, this is a phone. <laughs> 
A little different, right? Okay, it looks like this, looks like that. It's a rotary phone, and uh, what happened was you could actually make phone calls with this at some point. Um, what you had to do to make a phone call, though, is on this dial here, you had to stick your finger here and turn the dial all the way around to dial one number and then let it go all the way back. And then you had to dial the next. So let me, let me, let me my, my phone number growing up was six, seven, one. <laughs> seven. So you get the idea. You had to have some patience if you actually wanted to make a phone call back in the day. And this cord here, listen, if you wanted to have some privacy when you were making a phone call, you had, I, we actually bought a really long cord, and I had to take the cord and like drag it over into another room. So you had a little bit of privacy, but everybody could tell where you were because they just had to follow the cord. <laughs> now, nowadays, see, nowadays we have text messaging, right? And, and one of the things with text messaging is that you don't have to spend as much time making contact with somebody as you used to have. And there's pluses and minuses to that, but, but here's the thing. When text messaging first came out, my, my sister downloaded a ringtone. And um, this was the ringtone. It said this, that every time she got a text message, a voice would come on and it would say this, you have a text message, which means someone thinks you're not worth the minute. <laughs> and everybody at that time, you know, because it wasn't as common, everybody at that time thought, yeah, well, why doesn't somebody call up and spend the time to call me? Now... It takes 10 minutes, 10 seconds to like type a text message. And you don't have to interact with a person's voice. You don't have to hear its, in, its inflections. And what I want to suggest is something we've lost with, with having things like this, not to say we should bring it back, but we've lost a way to develop deeper relationships because I think the, the best way to develop relationships is face-to-face, -face, but, but if you can't do that, if you can hear a person's voice, it, it's better than looking at a screen. Now... The point I'm making is, is this, that when rotary phones was all there was, if you wanted to call somebody, I mean, I showed you how long it takes to call somebody, you really had to want to call them. Like, it wasn't just like you could throw it away. You had to really put the effort into making that phone call. It wasn't like texting. It wasn't even like making a phone call today. You had to remember people's phone numbers. I know if you're younger, you're like, what? That was a thing back then? Yeah, you had to remember people's phone numbers. But, but, and, this is, and this is the point. Listen closely. The effect, the, the effort you put into those phone calls helped to develop deeper relationships. You had a crew. And if we're going to grow as disciples, if we're to advance the mission, we need a crew to encourage and challenge us. But we also can't miss the reason behind what we do, and that is point two. We have to be compelled by a cause. We have to be compelled by a cause. And so if you go back to the scene in Matthew 10, Jesus calls his disciples together and says, I got a job for you, remember, right? But, but here's the thing. If, if you're going to take this job, you need to be sold out for this cause because it's going to be hard. Jesus is teaching his disciples here about discipleship, and then he goes on to tell them the cause in verses 5 and 6. Jesus says this. He says, these 12 disciples Jesus sent out, instructing them, listen, go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now, if you've read the whole book of Matthew... Uh, you may be a little confused by this. Why does Jesus say go to the Gentiles, or don't go to the Gentiles, go to the people of Israel? Because at the end of Matthew, it seems counterintuitive, Jesus gives his famous great commission where he says you need to go to all the nations and make disciples. So what is he doing here? What does this instruction have to do here? Well, I think if we're honest, we have to admit that it's easier to relate to people who are like us, Right? that we have more in common with people who we know and whom we have a shared culture, who speak the same language, and on and on. For example, uh, if, if you're not from New Jersey, if you're a non-New Jersey person, you didn't grow up here, it's sometimes it's difficult to understand the nuances of living and ministering in New Jersey. In fact, if you move from out of the state, you may ask questions like these. Why in the world do people here debate why you should call it Taylor Ham or Pork Roll? Like, why is that even a thing? Like, why do we spend our breath on that? Or, or secondly, why do we call an interstate highway? Why don't we call it a highway? Why do we call it a parkway? Although if you travel that many days, maybe you feel like you're, it's like a parking lot. 
Or if you go down to that sandy place, why is it not called the beach? Why is it called the shore? See, listen, the point I'm making is this. Familial and cultural connections often make it easier to minister to people. That we can share the gospel with people we know because they know us. There's also a flip side to that. That it actually may be harder to share because they know us. That they can point out our faults or there's more risk because we can lose relationship. In fact, our, our, our teenagers are going to be going on a mission trip this summer. They'll go someplace that's far away from here. They'll, they'll serve. They'll share the gospel with people that they probably haven't met before. And, it, and it's a really exciting experience, right, to go on this trip to meet new people. But when you come back home, you're still called to share the gospel with people around you, with your friends, with people that are in your neighborhood, And I've had kids tell me that they don't want to do that because they're afraid of losing friends. But we're called to go to the people we know. See, what Jesus is saying to his disciples is this. It's not time to go to the Gentiles yet. You're not ready to go to the Gentiles yet. The principle is this. When we begin the mission, we start with easier tasks, with people we know and love. And so the natural question for us to ask is this. Who are the people we know that God is calling us to. Jesus continues in verse 7. It says this, he said this, as you proclaim, uh, and, as, and proclaim as you go, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse lepers, cast out demons. You receive without paying, give without pay. Now in verse 7, we come back to a key theme in Matthew, the theme of the kingdom. Again, that's why we're calling the whole series His Kingdom Come. The disciples can't preach the cross yet because it's in the future. But the cross is where the king will give his life. His kingdom has come because the king is here. And the works that Jesus mentions in verse 8 are a demonstration of his kingdom power. These works verify the word, the king has come. See, Jesus isn't looking for high-profile people. Jesus is looking for faithful people. People who are the most faithful know and believe in the cause, that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Do you believe that? See, when Tom Hanks and his men find Private Private Ryan in the film, he he doesn't want to leave. He doesn't want to leave. He wants to stay with the men, his troops, so that he can keep fighting because there's a cause he believes in. In his mind, that cause is is, is worth fighting more than being with his family. And so the first mark of a disciple is a heart changed by the gospel of grace. They want others to know how to be saved. And it's only when our hearts are changed that we're truly sold out for the gospel. In fact, when somebody's heart is transformed by a cause, something happens, right? Right? When it's captured by a cause, you respond differently when you get a phone call, when you pick up the phone. For for example, my wife is a nurse, and I'll give a shout out to all the nurses out there who work crazy hours and who don't get holidays off and who seek to give the best care they can to their patients. God bless you. We love you, right? I put it up there. Nurses are awesome. In fact, anyone who knows the healthcare industry knows that, that a call can come at any time because the hospitals don't close. The nursing homes don't close. There's always sick people who need help. And when there's a crisis, the nurse gets a call or the first responder gets a call or the doctor gets a call, and what do you do? You answer it, and you go in to help if it's needed. Now, you may be asking the question, if you're not in that field, why would anybody choose to go and and work in a field like that? Because you believe in the cause of helping people. And so likewise, if you're really and truly a Christian, if your heart has been gripped by the gospel, you'll believe in the cause. And so church, I would ask the question of all of us today, has your heart been transformed by the gospel? Until that happens, we won't give everything for the cause. We won't really live for the cause because something better is always going to come along, right? Why? Because there will always be a cause more important in our hearts. And so living for Jesus It's not going to be a priority if our heart hasn't been changed because Jesus really isn't our king. 
Ask yourself this. What would I really give my life to? And the answer to that is what has truly captured our hearts. Because here's the reality. If you're not willing to give yourselves to a cause, you won't face the challenges when they come. And that's point three, that we have to face the challenge. And here's where the rubber meets the road. Because this world is a, is a very dangerous place, and it's growing increasingly hostile to Christians. And if we don't buy in and celebrate the world's, secular world's values, lock, stock, and barrel, we will be mocked. We will be ostracized. We'll face the mob on social media and Twitter and be Twitter shamed. Will they come for us one day? If you don't believe me, you haven't been keeping up with the news. In fact, let me share a story. Um, most of you are aware that the Chinese government is really hostile to Christians among other countries, but let me just talk about China here. In, in our modern age, they use sophisticated surveillance technology to monitor the activities of Christians. In fact, churches in China face direct attack from the Chinese government. One such church is Early Rain Covenant Church in Chengdu, China. More than 100 members of which are, were arrested on Sunday, December 9th, 2018, just a little over a month ago. Police sealed off the church building and removed property to discourage the church from returning. The church reports that at least 10 members are in a criminal detention, and among those are, is Pastor Wang Yi, senior pastor of Early Rain, and his wife, Zhang Rong. Now, they're charged with inciting to subvert state power and face up to 15 years in prison. Now, foreseeing that he may soon face imprisonment, Pastor Wang Yi wrote a declaration in September, on September 21st of 2018, and he updated it on October 4th. He noted that this letter was to be published by the church 48 hours after he was arrested. And in the letter, he explains what he calls faithful disobedience and how it's distinct from political activism and civil disobedience and how Christians should carry it out. This is what he writes. He said, I firmly believe this, what he's doing, is, an, is a spiritual act of disobedience. That in modern authoritarian regimes that persecute the church and oppose the gospel, spiritual disobedience is an inevitable part of the gospel movement. Wow. Just, I, I encourage you to go online and find this, this letter. It is, it is just mind-blowing and, and challenging. Because this man... And this church were sold out for the gospel to the point of imprisonment. That spiritual disobedience is inevitable, he says. This pastor and his church faced the challenge and stood firm. And if that type of persecution ever comes to America, what will we do? When we face the challenge of persecution, will we be spiritually disobedient for the sake of the gospel? See, Jesus doesn't promise a safe life for his disciples. In fact, he says we're going to be mocked and persecuted for his name. The journey of discipleship is arduous and long. I mean, listen to the further instructions that he gives in verse 16. Jesus says this. He says, behold, I'm sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. So be wise as serpent and innocent as doves. Now, that's a really interesting word picture Jesus offers here, and it tells us three things. First, Jesus sends us to the wolves. And you say, what? I mean, it doesn't say the wolves are in the distance. It says we're in the midst of the wolves. The wolves are around us. How will a disciple survive? Oh, he says you need to be wise as a serpent, that we have to have guile and cunning that they're all around you, that serpents know that they're not liked and they know how to hide themselves. Therefore, we must use wisdom to avoid unnecessary danger. You say, good, I hate danger. Ah, but what does Jesus also say? He says, be innocent as doves. And these birds, if you know anything about a dove, are famous for being fearlessly naive. That when a human approaches, they're the last bird to flee. And so there's a tension he's getting at here that, that we need to be wise, but we can't avoid every danger. Verse 17, he says, Beware of men, for they will deliver you over to the courts and flog you in their synagogues. To so listen to this, he says, The very people I'm sending you to 
are going to arrest you and beat you. That I told you to go to the house of Israel, Jesus says. He says, I I said go to your people, but they're going to turn against you. And that phrase, deliver you over, has dark overtones. It literally means to be betrayed. He's saying your own people are going to betray you. And Jesus doesn't stop there. He says in verse 18, and you're going to be dragged before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them and the Gentiles. Now there's something oddly exciting about this. To come before a governor or a king and to bear witness to Jesus, even in the face of danger. That's the very thing the Apostle Paul did in Acts 24 to 26. It sounds like something out of the Lord of the Rings. And yet it's what we're called to. For Jesus' first followers, it was the beginning of the mission to the whole world, not just the Jews. So friends, like Jesus' first disciples, like the Apostle Paul, like Pastor Wang Yi, are we ready to face the challenge? Indeed, even thinking about it may make our knees knock. Well, listen to what Jesus says in verse 19. He says this, When they deliver you over, do not be anxious how you are to speak or what you are to say, for what you are to say will be given to you in that hour. Now take notice, Jesus doesn't say if you're delivered over, he says when you're delivered over. In other words, it's going to happen. And Jesus says, I know you're going to get anxious. I know your voice is going to waver, your heart is going to race, and there's going to be tears in your eyes, but he says, don't be anxious. Why? Why? Verse 20, for it is not you who speak, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. You are my disciples, he says. I've given you a mission. I am going to make sure it's carried out. You will not face these challenges under your own strength, church, but with the strength of my Holy Spirit. You see, as hard as it is to see in the moment, when persecution comes... And when the wolves are ready to pounce, Jesus' mission has the long game in view. It's not about today, it's about eternity. It's about seeing more and more people come into the kingdom. It's about the mission. Now again, the phone is interesting. Because even these older phones, they were just mediums to developing relationships. In fact, when men in the past would go overseas to war, they would long for the day when they could, they could pick up the phone and they could call and talk with their wives or their family. But there's a flip side to the phone, even to your own phone that you have today, and it's this. The phone can also call us into danger. Now, there's been many iterations of the DC Comics hero Batman, latest of which with Ben Affleck, who liked to growl as Batman, oh, Batman, right? I actually recently heard that he's not playing Batman in the next movie, but that's another story. I think one of the most memorable takes on Batman was the Adam West TV series of the 1960s. He didn't growl as Batman, but he had that really cool song, na 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 Batman. You didn't forget who he was. But if you remember watching that, every time a villain showed up on the scene, what did the police do? They took their red phone, right? Thank you, Bell Labs. Took their red phone, they picked it up, and they called who? They called... Batman. And Batman came in and he rushed into action and he would fight Penguin or he would fight the Riddler or he would fight Catwoman and we got these really cool uh, words on the screen like pow, biff, zoink, bang. But here's the thing. Batman didn't get a call on the phone unless there was danger. That if he didn't have to fight the forces of darkness that threatened Gotham City, the phone didn't ring. It didn't. And so church, when Jesus calls us, yes, he calls us into community. Yes, he calls us to proclaim the kingdom. But in so doing, he calls us into danger. And he gives us the strength to face the challenge. Why? Because he loves this world and he wants us to love it too. How does he give us the strength? Because he faced the challenge for us. In fact, Jesus says in verse 24 that we need to imitate him. And the hallmark of being a disciple is to be like Jesus. How? We need a crew. Jesus had his disciples. 
We need a cause. We need to live for a cause. So did Jesus. He came from heaven to earth to die on a cruel cross. And we have to face the challenge. And so did Jesus all the way to the cross. Now, some of you may be sitting here saying, Pastor Bob, this is daunting. How do I do this? It's scary. I can't. Yes, it is. And no, you can't do it under your own strength. But Jesus, also, Jesus recognized that we need the empowering presence of the Holy Spirit. And he recognized also that there's barriers to being a sold-out follower of Christ. And that's where he gets at the end of chapter 10. And so as we start to wrap up here, what I want to share with you are three barriers to becoming a sold-out follower of Christ. Three barriers from the text that keep us from picking up the phone. Fear, fame, and family. Jesus comforts us with these words in chapter 10, verse 26. So have no fear of them, he says. Have no fear of them. For nothing is covered that will not be revealed, or hidden that will not be known. Now you read a chapter like Matthew chapter 10, and you hear about all the persecution we're going to face as believers, and it's scary, right? It's scary. Some of us may even be experiencing some of those things in our lives right now. But when Jesus calls us into the mission, he promises to get us through it. And so he says, have no fear. Other translations say, do not fear or fear not. So ask yourself, what are you afraid of? Did you know that the phrase, do not fear, is the single most used command in the Bible? That the Bible tells us to shake off fear more than a hundred times, and every time it gives us a reason. And so I ask you again, what are you afraid of? You see, fear can be paralyzing. It keeps us from doing something. Now, I have the privilege of working on staff here at NBC full-time. Um, I am blessed to be able to fulfill, to fulfill my life's calling as a pastor here, and the one thing I realized with that, though, is that I can't forget how difficult it can be in the marketplace. And when I hear stories from folks in our church about the challenges they experience from coworkers, it reminds me how scary this world can be. And if you're one of those, those few Christians in your office or, or at your school or in your profession even, it certainly might feel like you're among the wolves. But what you have to hear today from Jesus is this, do not fear. Do not fear, I am with you always. I have overcome the world. In verse 26, he tells us these people who persecute us, want every, and the, everything will be revealed on the day of judgment. Everything they said, everything they did, it's going to be revealed. Leave them to God. So let me ask you again, does anyone at your job or your school know that you're a Christian? Or would, be this, or would they be surprised to hear that you're a church today? If people don't know you're a Christian out of fear, remember Jesus' words, do not fear. Don't fear. Now, a second barrier connected to the first is fame. Or more accurately, I would say this, the fear of losing popularity. But as we learned already in chapter 10, sold-out followers of Jesus will be hated, that the world will turn on us that we may be betrayed and beaten and shamed all for the sake of the gospel. And so Jesus goes one step further in verse 34. He, write, he says this. He says, do not think that I have come to bring peace on earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. Now you say, hold on a second. Hold on a second. Wait, wait. Uh, doesn't the Bible say that Jesus is the prince of peace? Right, right. Didn't the angel sing at Christmas, peace on earth, goodwill uh, to men? And that's true. So what is Jesus' message here? Well, in this context, peace is the result of the salvation that Jesus is bringing, peace between us and God. But the mission to the lost world will not result in peace for those who are bringing the gospel. See, in biblical categories, the sword was a symbol for conflict and warfare. And so the sword here is symbolic for judgment on those who don't believe. In any case, what Jesus is saying is that I didn't come to be popular, and neither should you. And if you're pursuing fame or receiving the accolades of, of people, examine our heart. Are we living for Jesus? 
Because Jesus offers a stern warning in verses 32 and 33. He says this, So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I will also acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But anyone who denies me before men, I will also deny before my Father in heaven. Now the final category I think is the most difficult. It's the category of family. And as you hear that, you may push back and say, well, hold on a second. How can my family be a barrier to me following Jesus? Well, for some of us in this room, this is very real, that there's strife in your family because you are a Christian. Maybe your spouse isn't a believer. Maybe your children have rejected Christ. Perhaps you're the first person in your family to come to faith, and your parents don't believe. In fact, if, if, listen, if, you're a, if you come from a Muslim or a Jewish or, or sometimes even a Catholic background, these words of Jesus are very real to you. And this is what he says in verse 35. He says, For I have come to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a person's enemies will be those of his own household. Now, honestly, that's, I'll be honest, it's hard for me to hear. Because for some in my own extended family, I've been mocked for my faith. Not in a persecuting way, but in a way that they don't take me seriously, or there's, there's some contempt for views that I hold. But again, that's, that's only one side of the coin. The, the other side is what Jesus says in verse 37, and it really gets at his point. This is what he says. He says, whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Now, if I examine my own heart, again, these words are are hard. Because it takes us to a natural question. Do I truly love Jesus more than anything? And if I'm honest, if we're honest... We love our wives, or, or we love our, our husbands, or, or our children, or our parents. We love them more than Jesus. And that's not to say we should not love our family. But what Jesus is getting at, and what he's been getting at this entire chapter, and you go all the way back to the Sermon on the Mount, he's been getting at this point. Will you be a sold-out follower for me? Will you love me more than anything? Now, I have two great loves in my life. My wife, Amanda, and my daughter, Jenna. And I remember the day I married Amanda like it was yesterday, just her coming down the aisle and being more beautiful than than anything still captures my heart because I know how blessed I am. The day my daughter was born, tears came uncontrollably to my eyes and I didn't think it was possible to love anybody I'd never met before. And she's such an incredible blessing to our family. And, And listen, I read a passage like this and two things come to mind. The first is this, the thought that Jesus would would not be Lord of our lives, that there would be strife between us because of our faith, would be very difficult to bear, and I know some of you feel that. Secondly, as beautiful as Amanda is to me, and as beautiful as Jenna is to me, the question Jesus asks me is this, am I more beautiful than them? Am I enough? And only when the answer is yes to that will they be blessed. See, Pastor John Piper puts it this way. He says, the greatest gift you can give your wife is loving God above her life. And thus I bid you now to bless, go love her more by loving less. And wives, the same is true for you, that your first love should always be Jesus Christ. Because you see, when we love, our fa- we love our family by loving God more. And so Jesus says in this passage, are you worthy of me? And what he's getting at is, do you love me more than anything? Will you follow me anywhere? Will you, will you be sold out for me? That's, that's where he concludes in verse 38. He says this. He says, anyone who does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. And so back at the beginning of this message, I asked this question, what will your legacy be? At the end of your life, will you be able to look in the mirror and say, when people saw me, they saw Jesus? I made it count. In fact, John Piper says it this way. He says, life is short, eternity is long, live like it. I'd invite the worship team to come back up. They're going to play one more song before we come to the table.
And as the movie Saving Private Ryan ends, the, the movie shifts back to the graveyard in, at Normandy. And old James Ryan is, is, is at the grave of Tom Hanks' character, John Miller. And as he finds the grave, he falls on his knees and he looks at the grave with tears. And his wife and his children come up next to him and they ask him what's wrong. And, and with tears in his eyes, he looks at his wife and he says this, he says, did it count? Did it count? And she's confused, and she asks him, what, what's wrong? What are you talking about? He says, he says, tell me I'm a good man. Tell me my life made a difference. What's happening? He is recognizing that other people gave their lives so he could live. That John Miller died on a mission so that Private James Ryan could live. And church, Jesus Christ died on a cross so you and I could live. And now he says to us, I need laborers who will go out and give everything for the mission. I need people who will lose their lives for my sake and for the sake of others. I need people who are willing to lose their lives for my sake so they can truly find meaning. And that's how Jesus famously concludes in verse 39. Whoever finds his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Church, the phone has rung. Will we answer it?